Hello, I'm Elizabeth Karcher, and I'd like to welcome you. See some faces coming on. This is terrific. My name is Elizabeth Karcher, and I'm the executive director of the Woodrow Wilson House. And it's my pleasure and honor to welcome all of you to our uh, weekly noon June Zoom conference calls about the suffrage movement. Um, the Woodrow Wilson House is part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And we've been uh, working with the National Trust on a movement uh, she leads uh, where women made history. And so part of that is to have uh, conferences and uh, speaker series about the suffrage movement. We started in February and uh, Tina will be our fifth of six speakers. And uh, we've been covering all aspects of the suffrage movement uh, and how that relates to Wilson. Today it's actually uh, more heavily on how Woodrow Wilson played a role in the suffrage movement, and we're looking forward to talking about that. Before we start, I'd like to give you an update on the Wilson House. Um, the, we are currently closed for tours. We are quickly moving into a stage two uh, opening uh, or phase two with Washington, D.C., and planning to welcome visitors to come. They'll be making appointments to visit and have tours on the weekends. And uh, we're trying to get up to speed to have that all in place to welcome our guests. In the interim, in the meanwhile, we've been working on a number of exhibits uh, outside. So we have a small victory garden that if you are on S Street, where the Woodrow Wilson House is located, please stop by and see the history of the victory garden. Uh, the history and fascinating story of Columbia, the image that was used on Victory Gardens um, it, during World War I. Uh, and of course, as our Victory Garden grows, bring your scissors so you can snip some of the herbs that were growing there. Uh, we're also planning and working on outdoor walking tours of Washington, D.C. There'll be four tours uh, about the neighborhood and one tour about Lottie Butler Wood who is the architect of the Wilson House and a number of other houses in the neighborhood. So uh, there'll be more to follow on that and you'll be able to get your script. It'll be an audio, self-guided audio walking tour and we're looking forward to launching that soon. We're also working on a suffrage outdoors exhibit, which will be coming this summer. Suffrage Outdoors will be covering the suffrage movement and we're using the beautiful historic Waddy Butler Wood uh, designed garden at the Woodrow Wilson House to put on this exhibition. Uh, we are really looking forward to that and it's very exciting. Um, the other things that we're getting ready to do at the Wilson House is to open our doors for rentals. So if you are considering uh, wanting to have a, a place for a small private uh, party, the Wilson House could be very well be your place. Um, we do weddings and birthdays, uh, book groups, book signings, speakers, conferences. Um, it's a, a small intimate location uh, right in the heart of Washington, DC. And so when you're ready to start entertaining, this could be your place. So please let us know if you'd like to schedule something or just a tour to see the, the facility. Um, so why the suffrage movement and why the Wilson House? This has not been an easy time for the Woodrow Wilson House, A, to talk about suffrage and also talk about race and racism. Uh, we make clear that Black Lives Matter and Black History Matters. And part of that is telling the story about the suffrage movement. Um, we have been doing this over the last uh, month on Zoom, and this conversation has evolved, given the times it's actually evolved, and we'll be changing the conversation and opening the door to be talking about Wilson and race in the month of July. So I encourage you to stay tuned and keep on tuning in on Tuesdays at noon as the, continue, as the conversation continues and, and de develops. I think it's really important today that we spend time listening and learning about what other people have to say uh, about the movement, about race, and of course about Woodrow Wilson and his role in that. Um, so I welcome you. There'll be more information uh, coming. It'll be on our webpage and we'll invite you to those talks as well. With that, I'd like to start uh, and introduce you to our speaker today, um, Tina Cassidy. 
Tina Cassidy has achieved widespread praise and recognition for her writing about women and culture. In addition to the book we are discussing today, called Mr. President, How Long Must We Wait? Alice Paul, Woodrow Wilson, and the Fight for the Right to Vote. She is also the author of two other important books, Birth, The Surprising History of How We Are Born, and Jackie After O, One Remarkable Year When Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Defied Expectations and Rediscovered Her Dreams. Tina is a former journalist who spent most of her career at the Boston Globe covering business, fashion, and politics, and is the chief marketing officer of WGBH, NPR's public radio station in Boston. Cassidy also serves on the Board of Conservation US. She lives in the Boston area with her husband, the author Anthony Flint, and their three sons, and a Norfolk Terrio terrier named Dusty. The book she'll be telling us about today, Mr. President, How Long Must We Wait, tells the little known story of the, of the suffragist Alice Paul's epic eight year battle with President Woodrow Wilson to have the U.S. recognize voting rights for all American women. Never before have these two historical figures shared the stage equally and the effect is a page-turning David versus Goliath narrative more resonant than ever as the centennial of the 19th Amendment approaches this year. The story highlights the human drama of these real-life characters from Paul's perilous prison hunger strikes to Wilson's moral and physical failings. Readers looking for a female heroes and lessons for today's politics will be inspired by this book. With that, I'd like to welcome Tina and uh, welcome to the Woodrow Wilson House. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and I really appreciate everyone tuning in today um, for this talk. Um, that was a, a very nice introduction, which I appreciate very much. I'll add one other thing, which is um, that in addition to WGBH being um, Boston's local NPR station, we are also the largest creator of content for PBS nationally. And um, one of our production units, American Experience, um, will be uh, launching a four four hours of um, four hours of documentary programming starting July sixth called The Boat, and it is about suffrage. And I think that for any of you on this uh, Zoom today who really are interested in suffrage, it's a fantastic film that I want to just give a plug to before we get started. Um, I'm going to give a talk for, uh, I'm going to sort of walk you through some slides, uh, about 25 minutes of that, uh, with a little bit of reading from my book in between. And then I'd love to open it up to questions for the last half hour or so. Um, I wanted to share some slides because I think that the uh, amazing um, photo documentation from this period really helps to bring the story to life. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is the suffrage movement and its parallels to today. While my book is obviously a historical narrative of how Alice Paul fought President Wilson and won voting rights for women, the parallels between this century old story and what's happening today are what compel me the most, reflecting contemporary issues about patriotism, racism, what's the right way to protest, how slow the pace of change can be, whether a movement can be divided and still be successful, and how to right the wrongs of inequality. So first, a little background about this story. I owe this book to a trending hashtag, which was hashtag Women's Equality Day. And I saw that on Twitter in, in August of 2016. I clicked to learn more, and it turns out it marks the day when the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. And despite how momentous it was to enfranchise half the population, uh, with this amendment. The story of how it happened was never part of my history lessons growing up, and that annoyed me. So I wrote a book about it. Who was Alice Paul, and what can we learn from her today? She was a Quaker from New Jersey, and her parents instilled in her the belief that everyone is equal. She was educated at a time when not many girls were. 
and she wanted to fight for social justice, which led her to a Quaker Institute in England where she could study more about it. And there she saw the Pankhurst. This is Emmeline Pankhurst here um, being carted away. Um, the Pankhursts were a family of women, the mother, Emmeline, and her daughters, Sylvia and Christabel, and they were the leaders of the more militant suffragette movement. And I'll just note that the term suffragette originated in, in Europe and it was meant as a derogatory term. The E-T-T-E -T -T -E at the end was uh, diminutive and meant as a put down, but the suffragists em embraced it and uh, took the term as their own. I don't tend to use it in my book unless it's explicitly um, sort of describing what I just uh, outlined uh, because it was meant as uh, derogatory. So the suffragettes in England, uh, these were women who had the audacity to speak on soapboxes on street corners and organize marches and rallies and votes for women. Alice Paul was captivated not just by what the Pankhurst were doing, but by how they were treated in response. She was so outraged by their arrests and harassment, she put her life on hold to join them. And in those couple of years in England, she learned everything she needed to know, mostly outside the classroom, to advance the women's movement in America. She sailed back home to get a master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania and decided to join the suffrage cause, which was stuck in a rut. So let's pause for a moment. Alice Paul was not yet a lawyer. She'd received her first of three law degrees in 1922. At that time, she was a student and an activist, but she knew that the laws were skewed against women. Her master's degree from uh, Penn was called Toward Equality, and it carefully picked apart all the laws that made women property of men. Imagine women weren't allowed to own land, get a divorce without losing their kids or their home, Women were unable to have their own bank account, even until the 1970s without having a man sign for it. These were all the ways laws were stacked against women. And every state had its own rules that kept women subordinate lesser citizens. The old school suffragists did not believe the federal government would ever grant the franchise. And so they politely asked for voting rights at the state level. As you can see here, since the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, they had made little progress. And by 1913, for example, women only had full voting rights in six states, all out west. You see them here in white, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Washington, and California. This is why Alice Paul believed it was time for a new strategy, a federal amendment. She joined the main suffrage group called the National Americans Women's Suffrage Association, or the National American for short, and tried to navigate within the existing framework for a new approach. At first, the National American humored Paul when she asked them if she could organize a suffrage procession, and they reluctantly agreed. And so on March 3rd, 1913, one day before Woodrow Wilson's uh, first inauguration, Alice Paul made history. On the left, you have Inez Milholland, whom Alice Paul chose to lead the parade, because frankly, she was not just a brilliant lawyer and active suffragist, she was also young and beautiful, which was the opposite of the stereotypical suffragist. And Alice Paul was nothing if not sharp when it came to public relations. But her strategy was not seamless. And while the parade was successful in generating attention, it did reveal some deep divisions. And this is one of the first parallels between men then and now that I would like to discuss, and that's how racism spoils democracy. So I'm gonna read a, a quick passage from my book about a very important moment on the day of this parade. The college section featured 1,000 females in their academic robes, Paul among them too humble to march up front with the National Americans' leadership, holding banners for Swarthmore, Bryn Mawr, Vassar, Wellesley, Smith, Goucher, George Washington, Radcliffe, Michigan, and Cornell. Howard, a historically black college, was also represented with a contingent of nearly 40 women of color. Most of them were members of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, founded the previous month for the purpose of joining the march. And I should just be explicit in saying that Alice Paul actively invited 
black women to participate in the march, but when word got out that she had done so, it caused uh, a backlash. Women of color also mixed within the labor section, portraying massive wage inequality. The toll of women helps to make the nation rich, one banner emphasized. A float carried dirty, disheveled women and children bending over sewing machines. Paul deliberately arranged the 39 non-suffrage states behind this group in alphabetical order, beginning with Alabama and ending with Wisconsin. In the middle of this lineup was the Illinois contingent, a group of 65 that included Ida B. Wells, a prominent African-American journalist who years before had exposed the widespread horror of lynching and had sued the railroad successfully for not letting her sit in the women's car. She had also helped found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909. While the march was a shocking and radical act, the likes of which had never occurred in America, racially integrating the procession was even more so, and it almost did not happen. Earlier in the day, when the Illinois women lined up for a practice drill, their leader, Grace Wilbur Trout, saw Wells and questioned whether she should be there. Her racist comment shocked the group, sending a buzz to the crowd. Some were so embarrassed they were speechless. Trout explained herself by saying, quote, many of the Eastern and Southern women have greatly resented the fact that there are to be colored women in the delegations. Some have even gone so far as to say they will not march if Negro women are allowed to take part. She blamed the decision on the leader of the national as well as on Alice Paul. Trout looked around for approval and found some, but another suffragist, Virginia Brooks, came to the defense of Wells. Quote, we have come here to march for equal rights, Brooks said, adding that if the women of other states lack moral courage, we should show that we are not afraid of public opinion. Wells was deeply hurt by Trout's remarks and let slip two large tears which she wiped from beneath her veil. Quote, if the Illinois women do not take a stand now in this great democratic parade, then the colored women are lost, Wells said before storming off. At some point after the procession began, Wells jumped back into the Illinois delegation to march in her rightful place, while black women also marched with the Delaware, New York, West Virginia, and Michigan sections. There was one group, however, that was segregated in the back. When word spread that Mary Church Terrell, a prominent African-American, would lead a strong showing of the National Association of Colored Women and that Southerners threatened a boycott, the men's section offered to march between these black and white groups. So in addition to the racial conflict um, after the march, when uh, Alice Paul dedicated herself to dealing with that as well as forming a committee for the federal amendment, she tried to raise money for it and the National American kicked her out, viewing her as competition. So Paul was left on her own, having to build a new organization from scratch. Let's also talk about protest then and now. Colin Kaepernick takes a knee during the national anthem at a football game and sparks a national debate. This is not the right way to protest, many have said. It's disrespectful. And that's what they told Alice Paul as well. To clarify, she did not call the march to the White House a protest. She didn't even call it a march. She called it a procession, and it was meant to be a thought-provoking thought display of the contributions women make to society. There were no provocative signs aside from those asking for voting rights. But guess what? It didn't matter what form their protests took. The Wilson administration and its supporters were really outraged, not about what the suffragists were doing, but what they were demanding, which was voting rights. I'm gonna read another short passage um, now to show the wide range of creative nonviolent protests Paul employed over a four year span during Wilson's entire first term that still made people angry. This scene picks up with Paul's suffragists leaving an unsuccessful meeting with Woodrow Wilson. This was one of many meetings. One thing that is uh, really fascinating to consider is that um, uh, Wilson um, considered himself a progressive. And one of the things that he wasn't progressive about social causes, but he was progressive about um, things like finance and government reform. And part of it was bringing more transparency to government. And so 
members of the public were actually able to show up at the Oval Office and request a meeting, which Alice Ball certainly took advantage of that um, on a number of occasions. And Woodrow Wilson was getting really sick of seeing her and all of the other suffragists come knocking on his door. All right, so I'm gonna read this, this passage that uh, picks up as they are coming back from an Oval Office meeting that did not go as they had hoped. The women slowly made their exit from the East Room of the White House and returned to their new headquarters. After four years of toil and hardship in the damp basement on F Street, the movement Paul reignited was finally in a sunlit space of prominence. Cameron House stood at 21 Madison Place, on the edge of Lafayette Park in front of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The building, a wide three-story brick townhouse, had several benefits. First, it was visible and just 200 steps from the White House. The Wilsons could see the suffrage flag fluttering from its perch on the third floor balcony. Second, there was ample space to work and entertain guests, from tourists and strangers walking in off the street to catch a glimpse of the women to those attending ever-expanding fundraisers. There were also bedrooms to accommodate Paul and others, eliminating their daily commute. Paul was now using Susan B. Anthony's old desk, a Victorian cylinder roll top that Anthony's secretary had donated to the National Women's Party, which was the name of the separate splinter organization that Alice Paul created. When the indignant suffragists walked through Cameron House's front door, they entered into a great hall with a large staircase and a fireplace that burned eternal. Paul was there waiting for them, ready to stoke their anger as they dropped into comfortable chairs in front of the flames and asked the question again, how long must we wait? With the women assembled in front of the fire, Paul pitched a carefully orchestrated idea, which she asked Harriet Stanton Blatch to present. Harriet Stanton Blatch, by the way, was the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She was another prominent suffragist. We have got to take a new departure, Blatch told them. We have got to bring to the president, day by day, week in, week out, the idea that great numbers of women want to be free, will be free, and want to know what we're going to do about it. We need to have a silent vigil in front of the White House until his inauguration in March. Let us stand beside the gateway where he must pass in and out so that he can never fail to realize that there is a tremendous earnestness and insistence in back of this measure. So far, with Paul as their leader, the women had marched four years earlier in 1913 in one of the largest and most outrageous protests America had ever seen. They had assembled an 80 car brigade to deliver signatures from all over the nation. They had testified, editorialized, and reorganized. They had formed their own political party. They held May Day parades in nearly every state in the Union. They raised funds and actively worked to defeat Democrats. They had a booth at a global exposition, collected a miles long scroll of signatures and drove it cross country from San Francisco in this car that you see here on the right, which is one of my favorite images of all times. You have to remember driving cross country then when there was no interstate highway and uh, you know, gas stations weren't really a thing, was, was, was pretty radical. Women didn't really even drive then. Um, so they got lots of PR for that, and that was obviously helpful to their cause. They dropped leaflets from the sky. You see Lucy Burns here uh, in back of this biplane. It's uh, another awesome uh, photograph. There was a big uh, sort of tail, a uh, fabric tail on the plane that was the suffrage flag. And they dropped a banner from the House Chamber's balcony. They also had sacrificed one of their own. That was Inez Milholland, um, who collapsed on part of her Western tour. But on this day, in front of the crackling fire at their new headquarters, with the White House at their backs, they may have been exhausted, but they were neither depleted of ideas nor the passion to continue the struggle. They listened as Blatch offered a new form of protest. In America, pickets had been a common union tactic, typically ending in violence, but suffragists had been employing the practice as well. Blatch had used pickets in her Votes for Women campaign with the New York legislature in 1912. So when she delivered her final plea to the women of Cameron House, they stirred. Will you not, she asked, be a silent sentinel of liberty and self-government? So it turns out 
that Washingtonians thought women standing silently holding signs in front of the White House was even more outrageous. And it triggered a series of unwarranted arrests with sentences up to six months. It's good to know, um, here on the left, you can see an artist's depiction of the force feeding um, that these women had while they were imprisoned. And on the right, you can see Lucy Burns, whom Paul had met in London. They were the dynamic duo of the movement. To protest the sentences, uh, the incarcerated women went on hunger strikes, but Alice Paul was also committed to a psychiatric ward. In the image on the left, you can see um, in the top right corner, um, that was Alice Paul's uh, hospital room. And they boarded it up because some of her friends would come by and, and try to sing songs and call up to her and keep her spirits up. Um, all of this um, actually amplified uh, the suffrage cause and the message for the need for a federal amendment continued to be heard. Next, I'd like to talk about the similarities between Woodrow Wilson and our current rise in white nationalism. One of the first things Wilson did after he was elected president was to segregate the civil service. As the first president elected from the South since Reconstruction, this move empowered white supremacists, triggered racial violence, lynchings included, and gave the Ku Klux Klan the boost it needed. In fact, Wilson even screened a movie in the White House about the KKK called Birth of a Nation. That is the very first film ever to be screened in the White House. Racism then combined with nationalism for another combustible mix. When the First World War erupted, Wilson clamped down on the First Amendment, attacking not just the press, but individuals who were criticizing him. And on the streets, there was a mob mentality. If any seemingly able-bodied man or those with a foreign accent were seen or heard in public, they were assumed to be a spy. Why weren't they off fighting in Europe? Vigilantes beat them, dragged them to the police, and the government supported this practice, due process be damned. So going after those he believed to be seditious extended to Alice Paul and the rest of the silent sentinels as well. I'll read another uh, brief passage here. The scene begins with suffragists arriving in shifts to their posts outside the White House gates to stand silently with their signs. So as you can see, the nature of their signs um, has changed. It's really much more about foreign policy as Wilson's looking um, at what's happening in Europe. The next day, a car dropped off Lucy Burns, Dora Lewis, and their heavy cargo in front of the White House about an hour before the Russians were expected to meet with Woodrow Wilson at 1230. The women unfurled their 10-foot hand-stenciled cloth sign stretched between two wooden posts, shuffled into position, and straightened the banner between them. The crowd, many of them on their lunch hour, slowed to read the wordy message, and that's the image you see here on the left. As pedestrians processed the words, some scribbled to transcribe the banner, the situation grew tense. To attack the president so directly in front of diplomatic guests was an unprecedented outrage, not only for those witnessing the protests from inside the White House, but for many who saw it happening on the street. Murmurs rippled through the crowd and cars stopped to take in the scene. The Russians arriving by motorcade passed quickly through the gate, but with enough time to see the sign. Bystanders, these were men and women alike, were enraged that the delegation had seen this protest. Take down that banner or I'm through with woman's suffrage for life, one man screamed at Burns. Lewis argued with the man as he stormed off and ignored her. You are a friend to the enemy and a disgrace to your country, one woman sneered at the protesters. Why don't you take that banner to Berlin? You're helping the enemy. Another man, a local builder driving by, stopped to read the sign. Let's tear that damn thing down. It's treasonable and I'm with you. And so they tore down the banners. So past is indeed prologue. We have so much to learn from the suffrage movement. For example, when we're fighting for democratic ideals, we need to include everyone or else we're really not fighting for democracy, are we? We're only fighting for some people. 
Change is hard and it can take a very long time. First Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls was in 1848, so it would be another 72 years before women could vote. And even then, not all women. Black women and black men face disenfranchisement through poll taxes and literacy tests. The federal government did not recognize Native Americans as citizens until 1924, so they could not vote. Those of Asian descent could not be citizens and vote until 1952. In the Voting Rights Act, meant to address all of these barriers to voting, passed in 1965, and yet voter suppression continues. There's always more work to do to make our union more perfect. And Alice Paul knew this. In fact, her work did not end when the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. Three years later, she wrote the Equal Rights Amendment, which passed Congress in 1972, but was never fully ratified by the necessary 38 states. However, in the last three years, Illinois in 2017, Nevada in 2018, and Virginia uh, just recently all ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, becoming the 36th, 37th, and 38th state. Um, I should note that there was a time limit for passage originally attached to the ERA, and that time has lapsed. However, there are legal scholars who, who believe that um, that time limit was incorrectly imposed in the first place, and there's also legislation in Congress that would strip the time limit. So it's very unclear from a, a constitutional law perspective what could happen to the ARA, but it's just fascinating that, you know, this nearly century old um, document, this idea that enfranchisement was not enough to create constitutional equality is still with us and it feels even more resonant today. So this, uh, you can see Jennifer Carroll Foy, uh, who's also you know, running for governor in, in Virginia, uh, was one of the leaders of the ERA um, Yes campaign uh, uh, this year. And in fact, women of color have been really at the forefront of the uh, uh, renewed ERA push in recent years. It's interesting to me to think about the parallels between uh, the 19th Amendment and the Equal Rights Amendment. This is the current map of the ERA yes states. Um, the green states have approved the Equal Rights Amendment and the white states have not. And of course, this looks very similar to the map that I showed you earlier in this presentation. Um, you know, those, that block of southern states is still um, sort of uh, standing strong against constitutional equality. And, um, you know, it's interesting to think why that might still be. But the women pushing for the ERA know that change is slow and their work is never ending. And they take their inspiration from something Alice Paul once said, which is carry the banner always. So thank you so much. That's, uh, those are the, uh, that's the end of my slides and I'm, I'm happy to take questions or comments. Great, thank you so much, Tina. That was really terrific. It's, it's remarkable to me, a few things when I see the presentation. Um, first, I think it's a really perfect time for us to be pondering uh, rights and voting rights in America and to consider protest movements, um, especially where we are um, today, uh, and to consider democracy and racism and how we can affect change by, by, by asking and demanding and protesting for change. Um, so I'm glad that we were able to have your presentation to explain a little bit about how we got here with Alice Paul. I also thought it's remarkable with the name Alice Paul, before the, the, uh, the run up to the centennial of the suffrage uh, centennial, we didn't really know Alice Paul's name. Um, it's remarkable that she was a little known character and yet she really was a mighty force behind an awesome movement. Um, so with that, I'm going to say open the floor and uh, our guests, uh, those of you on the call, you can put your question into the chats and direct it directly to me, privately to Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Karcher, and um, I will bring them to Tina. Uh, or you can just open it up and put it for everyone to see if you don't, if you don't know how to put it to directly make it private. Um, but I do have some questions before the 
before uh, our audience starts asking questions, I had some questions that I wanted to know. So sure. um, in your uh, mind, do you see other heroes in this story other than Alice Paul? Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, to think about Mary, Church, Terrell, and uh, the Delta sorority sisters and Ida B. Wells um, stepping up and marching in the 1913 procession must have taken immense bravery. I mean, knowing that many of the white women who had organized the march um, did not want them there, but also knowing that it was a hostile atmosphere that they were stepping into. This was an inaugural crowd mostly uh, white men from the South um, who were uh, not just against women voting, but also, you know, did not want to, um, you know, give black Americans any more power than they already had, which was very little at that point. So, you know, I just, I can't, I am a very empathetic person, but I cannot imagine what that must have felt like for them. I mean, they, they cared so much about the cause. What they did that day was not the only, of course, the only time that they protested and put themselves out there, not just for suffrage, but for issues of racism generally. You know, Mary Church Terrell was one of the pickets outside of the White House as well. And so, you know, it's fascinating to, to look back and say, okay, we barely know the name of the white woman who organized a federal amendment campaign, which took eight years. Um, we definitely don't know um, the names of the black women who were right there um, marching and protesting with her. And I think that we need to recognize all the women um, who were involved in the struggle. So there are so many more names of, of women. Um, you know, it, even though Alice Paul was the leader of the movement, there were regular ladies all across America who were sending in their 25 cents for an issue of The Suffragist, which was a publication that Alice Paul created. Um, to raise money for the cause. You know, it, it took many, many women to make this happen. And frankly, it took the men too, because they were the ones who were in power and had to vote to transfer some of that power uh, to the suffragists. Mm -hmm. um, it is an amazing story that you did have to have both the men and the women and, and uh, you know, to make that change. Do you think, um, well, let me go to some of the questions that are coming in and then we'll come back to mine. So do you know where Alice Paul voted? She was living in DC. What did Alice Paul say about excluding residents of Washington DC from the 19th Amendment? Uh, she says, both my grandmothers lived in DC and the 19th Amendment did absolutely nothing for them. We hear about Native Americans and Asians being excluded, but the fact that DC women were left out is hardly ever mentioned. Um, it's an excellent point. I mean, disenfranchisement comes in so many forms. And yes, Alice Paul was a resident of New Jersey, and she did cast votes there. Later in life, she lived in, in Connecticut. But without a, without a doubt, um, you know, the, the, the fact that D.C. residents uh, are, are still excluded from voting is pretty shameful. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. Last week, we learned about a little bit about uh, Edith Wilson, who's Woodrow Wilson's wife, second wife, uh, she was the first lady to vote, um, mm -hmm. the first lady to have the, the, the right, uh, or I shouldn't say the right to vote, she had the, she voted, uh, and she d voted absentee in New Jersey, but because while she was um, married and the president was alive, she was considered a resident of New Jersey. Um, after his death, she became a resident of uh, the District of Columbia, and she no longer had that right. So she actually only got to vote in one election in her lifetime, which is rather remarkable. Um, it is remarkable. And it's also worth noting that Edith Wilson was not a suffragist and she did not believe that women should vote. Yes. Uh, I saw, when I saw the picture of the car and the cross country road trip, she was very emancipated and very free in many ways. She had a driver. She was one of the first women in, in uh, the District of Columbia to have a driver's license. And she That's drove right. a car. Wilson didn't know how to drive a car. Uh, and so she had the car. And, but she was not in favor of, of, um, of the suffrage movement. I think she was... No, she was... She was a social conservative, but she also owned a business too. And so you're right, she was emancipated in, in many ways, but um, that social conservatism really held her back when it came to voting. For those who don't know, I will also just add that at the end of Wilson's presidency, he was incapacitated by a stroke and Edith Wilson was 
basically like the default de facto president making many decisions um, behind the scenes, which is just another layer of irony for a woman who did not believe women were capable or should be allowed to vote. <clears throat> Uh, there's more to follow on uh, Edith Wilson. Her birthday, the anniversary of her birthday will be coming up in October, and we're going to be doing something to, to celebrate that at the Wilson House. Um, there'll be actually a movie coming out about her as well through the Smithsonian. So uh, she's a character, and I think the American women are going to learn, and men are going to learn a little something about Edith Wilson. Um, so this was uh, another question we have. There was women in California who had the right to vote for president who were responsible for Wilson's reelection in 1916 by providing a margin of a few thousand votes. Um, uh, that's my understanding as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about the women in the Western states that had the right to vote and how they helped him get into office on his reelection? Yeah, there's a, so first, the, a lot of people ask why the Western states allowed women to vote first. Um, you know, these were not very populous states. They were large. And so the states wanted their women to vote because it helped them um, have more clout in Washington. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that Alice Paul recognized that from a strategic perspective, she needed to convince the women voters of the West to come uh, to her line of thinking around the 19th Amendment to try to vote Wilson out for the second term. This was a pretty radical move because up until then, um, suffragists writ large decided that they were not, not gonna make the issue political. It didn't matter which party you belonged to, suffrage was gonna be neutral. Everybody should believe that women should be allowed to vote. And Alice Paul said, well, that's ridiculous. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat in the White House, whoever you are, I'm gonna hold the party in power responsible. So Wilson was a Democrat. And so Alice Paul said, I'm gonna hold the Democrats in power responsible for this, not just at the federal level, but also at the state level. So you can imagine that it might've been confusing for voters who were perhaps hardcore Democrats, to try to think about voting as on a one-term, on a single-issue platform. And, and, a, and a lot of them didn't. Um, and I think that still holds true for the way voters act today. You know, it's not always about a single issue. Um, voting and how people approach it is, is very complicated. Um, you know, eventually, though, her, her, it didn't work. Um, it didn't work in his uh, first re-election campaign. But in the midterms in 1918, that strategy actually did help make Democrats very, very nervous about their prospects, not just in the midterms, but in the 1920 election. And they saw that public opinion was changing and they needed to get on the suffrage bandwagon. Well, um, another one, another question came in, where was Alice Paul hospitalized and how long was she there and what did it take to get her released? Yeah, she was only in this, uh, this hospital. This was in uh, Northern Virginia, I believe. She was only there for a short time, a few days. Um, Woodrow Wilson himself ordered her uh, release because he saw that people were, um, you know, he was, getting, he was getting blowback for it, that she should not be treated that way. Um, this was also true with the suffragists who had gone on hunger strikes in Ockigan Workhouse, um, also in Virginia. And so, you know, the idea really was how, what, what can the women do to bring more attention to the cause from a PR perspective? And the worse they were treated, the more attention they got. And, and Wilson finally came around to that. They basically couldn't, couldn't win. Yeah. They did a great job of social media. If, if, in today's world, they would have been terrific at tweeting and uh, Instagram and the images are terrific. The tweets are yes. great. So they would have really been a dynamic. Well, I also have to say, they were young. Alice Paul was young when all this took place. How old was she? Oh, she was in her early 20s. But you know, she if you think about it, um, that was just the beginning of a very long career. I mean, she was active in women's rights. Yeah, she died in her 80s, um, right up until the very end. She didn't have any other career. Um, so not only was she involved in the 19th Amendment and the Equal Rights Amendment, she worked with the United Nations um, on their Women's Council. She worked with global organizations after the Second World War to, um, to fight for women's rights all over the world. Um, it's the only job she ever had and never really cared about. Um, very sad, passionate. She died, she, very passionate. Um, she died penniless in a, in a nursing home in New Jersey. 
<sighs> well, so speaking of parallels today, uh, the last years of the suffragist fight occurred during a pandemic. How did the pandemic affect suffragist advocacy and protests? Yeah, it was definitely happening, um, especially in New York. Um, uh, I'll tell you the story of, of one woman that, that might help you uh, put this in perspective. Um, her name was Ellen Lamott, and she was uh, a nurse originally from Baltimore who had organized suffragists there, also went to learn from the Pankhurst and filed dispatches for the Baltimore Sun about what was going on there. She came back to New York in the summer of 1918 from, from Europe and uh, really needed a break and, and was hanging out in upstate New York um, in the country when uh, the pandemic broke out. And so she went into the city and volunteered her service as a pandemic nurse, caught the Spanish flu, was terribly ill in bed for a whole month, but 1918, the fall of 1918 was the first year that women could vote in New York. So she crawled herself out of bed and cast her first ballot. And so, you know, while, um, you know, we can only imagine how scary that must have been just to, to think about people, you know, dragging themselves out of their deathbed to, to vote and how empowering that was. Um, you know, such great highs and such great lows both happening at the same time. So yes, women had to work around the pandemic. Um, but, you know, women had fought, you know, issues that were equally sort of serious and preventive um, in terms of um, allowing them to fully participate in society. So they tried not to let it get in the way. Mm -hmm. It's surprising to me today when you, when you read statistics of what participation, uh, voter participation is where turnout is in these low numbers. And you think we worked so hard to get this vote and the thought that people are not showing up to exercise that right. Uh, it's just, it's that I'm always surprised by that. Um, a question came in uh, that I, I, I'm anxious to hear your answer to this. She's, this it comes from Deborah. She says, I read your book recently for research purposes. I've created an original show during the music, using the music from the suffrage movement. I appreciated your mention of music like when the women sang in the prison or when they sang glory, glory, hallelujah. I've found so many songs from the Library of Congress, even anti-suffrage songs. So what influence do you think the suffrage songs and protest music had on the movement? Oh, what a great, uh, what a great question. And I am really interested in, um, in seeing what you've created. I, please share it if you can. Uh, I mean, song has always been part of solidarity movements. I mean, even if you think about, um, you know, how, how slave songs um, kept them going um, on the plantation just to connect them to their humanity and to try to, um, you know, lift each other's spirits. I mean, song can have a great impact. People sing in church on Sundays. Um, you know, it, it was definitely true of the suffrage movement. It's still true. Uh, if you go to protests today, there will often be songs. Um, it's a way for people to connect with each other at a very personal level when people can sing together and say the same words together. It is a sign of, of solidarity and it can also be sort of inspiring and calming um, and reassuring. And so, you know, yes, music had an impact then and I think it still does today on movements. Also, I would just say, if you think about the 60s, we haven't really talked about that too much today, but the civil rights movement, I mean, that is a time of, you know, we all knew the anthems, right? And we can probably all still sing many of those songs today, both popular um, music and, uh, and sort of, you know, traditional protest music. It's really fascinating to think about. Um, so a few more questions. So how was her, how were her efforts funded? You said that she was sell, selling the, the uh, magazine 25 cents a pop. Um, how else yes, was that? yeah, mostly through donations. And uh, there were a few exceptionally wealthy women, including Alva Belmont, uh, who was uh, from New York. If any of you have ever heard of the Marble House in Newport, um, that was Alva's uh, mansion. Um, and Alva, you know, Belmont basically opened up her checkbook and would write 
checks to Alice Paul to keep it all going. Uh, in fact, the Belmont Paul House in Washington, DC, which is now part of the National Park Service, is in honor of Alva Belmont's um, financial contributions. Um, it was really a mix of very wealthy women making donations and then, you know, your, your everyday people just sending in a nickel, a quarter, a dollar, whatever they could afford um, to keep it going. But, you know, Alice Paul was never a wealthy woman. Every cent she had went into the work. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it shows that, uh, and, and she was always fundraising. I mean, I think that it was, she was quite sad to have to always be fundraising. It consumed so much of her time. And it also created tension with other, you know, with, with the other, um, uh, the other side of the movement with the national, that was one of the big schisms, how to spend the money and who to, who to ask for contributions from. And it's just striking that, uh, you know, organizations, nonprofit organizations are often left sort of fighting amongst each other for donations, as opposed to, you know, everyone sort of being supported uh, in an effort to, to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. We have another question that came in. Um, the, and this is from Heath. Uh, uh, Actually, and I have to thank, this is Heath Lee. Heath Lee introduced me to you. So thank you, shout out oh. to Heath. Thank you very thank you, much. Keith. Thank you, Heath. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain the connection between Bolshevism and the suffrage movement? This seems to continue in the 1970s with the connection between feminism and communism. What is the connection? Uh, was, why is this connection always made in press used against the women? Well, that's really interesting. I, I'm not a scholar um, on Bolshevism, but I will say a couple things. One, Russian women had the vote before American women did. And I will also say that you can, there were many socialists involved in the suffrage movement and they may have been inspired by Bolsheviks in that they didn't, that they, they both believed in shared power. They did not believe in authoritarianism or in kings or czars. Um, and you know that's why the the comment of Kaiser Wilhelm was so uh, sorry Kaiser Wilson was so stinging um, in in America. You know, I mean, America has always really been about sort of freedom and individualism in a cultural way, a deeply cultural way. Um, but for marginalized um, people, whether that was women who could not vote and could not even have their own bank account, you can imagine the appeal of a system that treated men and women equally, at least, uh, you know, in terms of the workforce or access to, to certain rights. Um, you know, I can't really speak to where that, that stands today, except I think those same principles apply. It's, it's really about shared power and equality more than anything. I mean, what name you call it, uh, people don't really talk about Bolshevism anymore, but uh, you know, you certainly hear a lot about socialism now. Uh, and, and I think it's for the reasons that I outlined. So one of the next question, another question comes in about um, about a song. Uh, the museum had a song sheet. She's good enough to be your baby's mother. She's good enough to vote with you. Um, how well known was this song? But then she this this uh, this is from Eileen. She also says they also had a ballot box that was used solely by women. Why would women need a separate ballot box? Uh, good question. So uh, I am not familiar with that particular song, um, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't popular then. There were many, many songs. Deborah says it was a huge bestseller. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. I love that. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as far as the, the, the ballot boxes, I mean, one of the things that, one of the reasons why women were held back from voting was because uh, there was this excuse that politics was dirty you know, women belonged in the home. You didn't want men and women mixing with each other. Um, you know, so ballot boxes were, uh, were separate in some situations. Also, there were cases where, you know, ballot boxes would be set up in saloons because that's where the men were. And while you could say, well, that was really clever because, um, you know, it meant higher voter turnout. It also meant that the women weren't going to want to go in a saloon. That's not where ladies would be seen. And so, you know, you had these sort of concepts starting to emerge around separate but equal. And we all know that there really is no such thing. Um, can you tell us if Alice Paul is the hero, is Wilson the villain? 
And can you talk about anything that Wilson might have done that was absolute, that was actually right? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, for me, they are, uh, it's up opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, he's a great foil for her heroic gestures. It is true that at the very end of his presidency, he came around to the idea of suffrage. Um, a cynical view of that would be to say he might not have really believed it himself, but he was reading the political tea leaves and knew that for the sake of his own party in 1920, he needed to support it. Um, but at the end of the day, he did support it. And I think that, you know, if you, if you want to not be cynical about that choice of his, um, you know, he did call Congress and say, let's push this through. We have to do this. You know, for me, it's a sign that anyone, no matter how opposed to doing the right thing, can learn, can move, um, you know, and, 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 and progress can happen. So, you know, I, I like to think of, I, I try not to be cynical about Wilson and, and try to look at it as an opportunity that we can all learn from. Right. Actually, that's how we take it at the Wilson House. We try not to be cynical. We try not to um, memorialize him either. We mm -hmm. try to take it and, and look at what he did and what the consequences were, um, whether they were deleterious to people or, or to, uh, to women, to African-Americans, um, and learn from that. That's, that's part of what the Wilson House is all about. So right. um, with that, I want to thank you very much for, uh, for your participation and for your presentation. It was great. I also want to say thank you to the National Trust again, for Histo National Trust for Historic Preservation, the movement uh, and the, uh, what they put together for um, where women made history is a big part of putting this together for us and helping uh, support the efforts that the Woodrow Wilson House is making to put the suffrage speaker series together. So I thank you. Um, please don't forget to tune in next week. We have um, uh, Dr. Erin Chapman from the George Washington University and she's going to, she's an African American woman, she's a professor, and she's going to talk about black women, suffrage and citizenship. And I think that is a very important conversation, uh, if not now when. So um, with that, People have also asked, are there, will we, these uh, lectures be online? We are trying to get them uh, put up on YouTube and we will have links to them on our website at the Uh And so more to follow, more to come. Thank you very much, Tina. And if you've got any questions, you can uh, send them to us and we'll make sure that we get them uh, answered. So thank you very much. Thank you much. so much.